Recording in progress, Jake Gillespie. We're live. Sure, How are you, sir? Welcome. Yeah, not too bad. Things are open. I'm vaxxed, microchipped, and I'm in pubs. Mate, I, I got the 5G as well. And um, obviously, this is a big money podcast. So we probably shouldn't talk about vaccines because we're going to lose all the money we get from this. <laughs> um, but, but, but I have the 5G as well. And my fucking internet in Cronulla is so terrible. Um, like, like I've lived in, in Asian countries. Um, that's potentially going to sound terrible. I've been to a lot of places around the world. I've never had as bad internet as Cronulla in 2021. I'd like to hear from uh, from some other people of Canal. See if you've got the same problem. But I actually don't have any qualms up here at the moment with my internet. My speed, my download speed's good. I'm on LimeWire. I'm getting all the latest songs. It's great. But no- I have to, you know what I have to do? We we've got Wi-Fi. Obviously, we're uh, you know professional operation here at Wandering Bear Sports. But I have to use the hotspot from my phone to every time I do a podcast because if I use the Wi-Fi, the video will cut out halfway through it. And, you know, when I'm talking to such classy people such as yourself, if the yeah. video cuts out halfway through, it's an incredibly bad look for the brand, you know? Well, that's very disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there, I've just given people a little bit of insight into, yeah. you know, what big business is really I like. What big business is like. I mean, I, I know that somewhere in his tower, Bill Gates is having the same problems. and that's- He's probably watching us now. Hey, Bill. Um, <laughs> mate, first thing, there's no footy on the weekend. There's no league on the weekend. It was a sad weekend. Uh, it, was like, it was a good weekend because I, I could smell the aroma of Winnie Reds and dirty carpets, and it was coming back, but there was nothing to watch. Um, I'm going to correct you there. Tyson Fury for Oh, fuck. Yeah, outstanding. One of, probably my favourite athlete in the world, and, and in my meaningless opinion, He's probably the most important athlete in the world, particularly at the moment. Let's talk about that in a sec. How was your first beer on Monday? It was pretty good. It was very strange. Like it's, it's almost, you, it's that deprived satisfaction. So you get that dopamine hit of being <laughs> back somewhere. And it wasn't, it was, it certainly wasn't a, a session, but I was just down at Jermoyne Sailors Club with a few mates having dinner. And it was, uh, it was good to be back. It was, uh, the fuck, uh, you know, mask off and just hanging out. It was, I don't know. It's just a little bit of a, it's something to do. It's something to look forward to in your week. Yeah. Yeah. I felt, mad. I felt exactly the same. I was craving Guinness. Uh, I've got a Guinness obsession. I, my taste continued to change. So I don't know why I've, I've fallen out with normal beer, um, mm. but straight to Norley's uh, at about one thirty. I ordered my first Guinness and, and, it was very you're right it's a very strange feeling because i've been so used to my little routine going for my morning walks going to the gym at home you know running talking to kate trying to do some work hasn't been a lot of work happening lately but to be surrounded by human beings again Mm. in a place that i haven't seen for over 100 days um i got very tired very quickly because it was a lot more stimulation than i'm used to yeah there was a particular area of the pub that was very stimulating as well so that really there was a lot of lights, a lot of lights flashing. So I, I was, I was exhausted. Um, but I don't know. It was just weird. I was, you sort of go to the bar. You're like, one beer, and they're like, <laughs> okay, and you're like, two beer, okay. Well, <laughs> well I was very disappointed in all these because I look obviously Pony turned up because that guy can smell a beer uh, <laughs> from, you know, he works like fifty kilometers away, and I'm sure that he could smell it from there. And I'm like, I was getting a bit tired, and rather than chew caffeine gum, and uh, you know get high on my own supply as it were i thought i would order a espresso martini mm, mm. you know as you do it about three o'clock on a monday afternoon yeah, sure. and and they didn't have any and i was i was furious absolutely furious first day back you've got this wonderful opportunity to make some money and you're not going to make espresso martini i couldn't even get a coffee or that usually usually they have that on tap now i would be surprised if normally you didn't have maybe they're still getting everything in could be well they they hand make their their cocktails they that's good that's you know nice. I've, I've had many of them over the years but i mean the yeah. bad thing about all these i suppose is that you'll probably get punched in the side of the head the good thing is they handmade cocktails you know it's funny mate i've i've been there <laughs> what i would estimate a hundred times way more probably i've seen one fight there really one fight and Cronulla, my, my whole time in cronulla i've probably seen Five or less than ten. I thought less it was than ten. I thought it was notorious. 
it, I think it was back in the day because it used to be. So when I first moved to Sydney, Cronulla was like the place to be on a Sunday. This is 2003. And, yeah. <laughs> 2007. So just after all the drama happened. Yeah. And um, so people used to go to Northies on a Sunday because it was like all the social, all the social lights and models and all that in Sydney came to Northies on a Sunday. Unbelievable. I, I would go and not drink. That's how good it was. And I'd very, yeah. very rarely go anywhere and not drink. Take it in, just to take it in. Just as like it was like a fashion show, mate. Honestly, yeah. and then and then it kind of evolved over the years, and it, it's had a few iterations. And it's you, it, like, have you ever been to Coffs Harbour? Yeah. So Coffs Harbour would have a popular pub for a year, and then all of a sudden, this other place would become popular, and yeah. then the next place would become popular, and then it would rotate. Yeah. So nor these kind of stop, nor these stop being popular and went through a, a really quiet phase. And then it started to get popular again. Then it died again. Then it started to get popular, and then and then um, COVID happened. So it's going to be that would be a shot in the arm. It'll be good to be back. Oh, it was good. And have you got any boys uh, lunches or anything? Yeah, yeah, about? mate. This Saturday, uh, a friend of the program, Lebanese friend of the program, Yai Ayuab. Ah, uh, oh, happy birthday, Jai, for the other day, birthday, Jai, right, buddy. Thirty-eight. Um, he's is he? No. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, he's, so we got just going to Balmain. Balmain is sort of like the place to be if you sort of if you live in a shit area around here and you want to look somewhere nice. Um, hey, we we had a terrific lunch. The boys from the Shire in Balmain just before lockdown, the the last lockdown, mm. mate. It's it's like letting a bunch of alcoholics into a brewery. Honestly, yeah, we actually had a very um, we had a meet and greet with some sponsors. In the 2015 Ram site, oh, yeah. uh, at the at the Balmain Hotel, which went a little bit sideways. Uh, well, current yeah. current plays involved, so they won't be mentioned. But it did go sideways that night. Uh, but oh, yeah, good area. I could only imagine with some of the characters involved in the Rams team. Um, I'm sure Jed Holloway was probably front and center of that. Well, as captain of the team, he'd have to be present. You know? Well, that's right. The greatest <laughs> Ram of all time. <laughs> um, he's, he's certainly in the top 100. He's in the top 100. Um, I, yeah, firstly, Fury. He's, I shouldn't have, I can't believe I left him out. Um, I was shirtless screaming on my Instagram story. He's he's my favorite sports athlete. And he's, he's, I think he's the best heavyweight to ever to ever fight. I love boxing. I know you're into your fighting as well. You know, I just don't, I don't, I know Mike Tyson's very popular, but I don't see Mike Tyson beating 6'9 Fury. He moves like a lightweight. He's something else. And to be honest, he sort of, it looked like his plan, he was, wasn't really dodging anything for the first five rounds. He was just like, fuck it, I'm just going to, I'm going to throw him, I'm going to throw bombs and eat bombs. Um, and he, he ate a few, but I don't know, there was something about when he went down. I, I wasn't even stressed. I was just like, he'll be up. He'll be all right. He's a special human being, that guy. Yeah. He's, um, you know what I like about, uh, so Anthony Joshua, obviously very popular, looks the part. And I think part of his appeal is that he does look the part. But I think that the reason that Fury is even more appealing is because he doesn't look the part. Mm. He's he's a guy that's had, you know, all sorts of issues. He's got been the champion of the world, went through hell, and and has made his way back from it. And he's just to me, he's a super inspiring, um, just a normal dude that happens to be the fucking greatest boxer of all time. Yeah, as, as a heavyweight, anyway. Yeah, yeah. No, I I, I agree. He's. Like I've read his book. Um, he's got an interesting upbringing as a as a traveller sort of thing. Not really knowing whether he's, he's a bit of Irish, bit of bit of English. And um, look, the thing about him is he beat Klitschko in his prime. You know, Anthony Joshua. I've never been an Anthony Joshua fan. I think he's fucking a good looking dude. He's shredded to the nines, but he gets hit a lot and he gets wobbled a lot and he's not he probably shouldn't be mentioned in the same sentence as Tyson Fury um and he doesn't he's also not as powerful as Deontay Wilder so I, you know he's a clear probably fourth um you know I, I don't I think Fury I'd really like to see he wants to bash Dylan White so that'd be great um if he does that and then he might fight you know I was listening to a recent interview he might fight two more times so I think he if he can go sort of 34 and 0 you know undefeated champion of the world i think that's all he that's all he needs and he's a very inspiring guy he's done he's done a lot for a lot of people and um 
he's just a hell of a fight. He's a hell of a fighter, mate. He was born a fighter. I think that's the difference. He was literally yeah. raised by his old man who's insane um, to just throw hands. That's I what like he- I like his I like the way his whole family speaks. Have you heard him all get I? interviewed? How do I, yeah. <laughs> they, were into, they, were, they interviewed his dad because he can't leave the country, can't go to America because he's been to jail. And he, they were saying that there was some back backstage stuff. And he's like, all my sons, all my sons know how to fight. It doesn't fucking matter. They'll, oh, Shane is fucking 6'3". He knows how to fight. Tommy will fucking flop. He's just like, basically like, yeah, if there's a backstage fight, fucking good on him. I was like, yeah, yeah. There's not a man born of his mother that can beat yeah, my boy Tyson. That's one of the I like. I know Flair like a butterfly sting on beast, but the, not a man born from his mother can beat me. He's a very, he's a very good one. I, I yeah. feel like AJ. Um, so like with Tiger Woods, right? If Tiger Woods was just completely honest from the start, I like fucking girls. I am a pig of a human. Everyone would have loved him. He would have been even more popular. But mm-hmm. because he was trying to be something that he wasn't, he. Um, you know, he went through that downfall and now he's back up again, Yeah, you know, as he should be. I feel like I'm not saying AJ is that type of character. He might be a clean cut character, but I just feel like I would like him so much more if he was that type of character. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's hard to think he isn't. I think he has a, does he have a daughter or something? Yeah, he's got kids, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, well, look, I, it's hard It's hard to think he's not spreading his seed somewhere in fucking London. But yeah, look, I just think he's really... He's a fucking good looking dude. He's very prop. He's very like marketable, but he's he he doesn't hold a candle. And I I I put my house on Usyk to beat him in the second fight. I have no fucking idea how AJ is going to touch him. And that, to be honest, it wants not the end of him, but it really moves him down to like Joseph Parker, Ortiz, like world class fighters. But not we're not talking about straps. I reckon you'll fight Deontay Wilder. I think Deontay Wilder will put a hole in him. I would love to see that. I fucking love Deontay Wilder, mate. He doesn't get like I'm not a huge boxing fan. I've got an appreciation for it, but I don't think he gets the uh, you know the credit he deserves. Like he's got something like 42 with 42 wins or something, 39 what? of them by knockout, something like that. You well, know, he's got a great story. He's got a great story. He's got a disabled daughter. He he got into fighting. He was he was driving kegs in Alabama, but. Where he lost me and where he's continuing to lose me is the second fight was fixed. You know, like my, I was poisoned. I watched a thing the other day. He had 15 different things. He was, he was poisoned. He was fixed. There was something in the gloves. There was something in he's training through in the towel too early. Like his inability to take a loss is difficult for me to still be on his team. So like even post-fight, like he's just not able to go, I lost that one, but I'll be back, you know? So that's where he's lost me a little bit, but other than that, I think he's probably one of the be- he's probably the one of the best power punchers ever. Um, he's an interesting character. He's a bad loser, terrible. But you know, so I just had some fucking weird thing going on with my earphones there. It's all right. Uh, I'm G. I DM Daniel Ricardo today. Yeah. Mm. For news. No, I just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a hey Dan's dunk from Wandering Bear Sports, mate. What are your thoughts on coming on the podcast? So if anyone knows him, I want to I want to start getting those type of people. Yeah, that would be nice. I um I think he was on part of my take the other week. He was very he was very good. He was very good. I've never heard of that podcast. <laughs> it's big. Um what while, while we're um hopefully people like boxing as well, otherwise you fucking tuned out. But we have at least the Wallabies did announce a spring tour squad. Um kind of interesting i don't think there's any huge spammers i mean well, i feel like they listen to our podcast i i'm convinced he's listening to the podcast or at least someone in there's listening to the podcast um obviously good to see sean mcmahon may play some more minutes will skeleton's going to make a seismic difference even if it's just in pure weight and standing there and rory arnold who was i think he was a late he was late to the piece in terms of age like scott farty was but he's world class he's fucking okay. world class so, you know who else is fucking good? Who didn't like Richie Arnold has been killing it over there. Yeah, absolutely he, killing yeah, it. Yeah, and I think that's why we'll never see him back. No, he'd be earning a fucking ton of money. Um, I I do think I don't understand what they're doing leaving Lalesio out, and I'm very critical of Lalesio at times. Um, I kind of agree with you because the the reasoning is is they want him to get a full preseason, and I'm like, well, 
uh, if he's not playing with the team, why can't you put him through a full preseason while he gets the experience of going on a Wallaby tour? Yeah, he can be double. He can be a double D, like not play double. But you could flog him. You can actually put some serious work into him over the next five or six weeks on the Wallaby tour. He gets the experience of game day, all the you know the 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 traveling, the the pressures of being in the test team, preparing, learning from Quaid, learning from James O'Connor. It does make sense, mate. They've already look. They've already invested in him. He's clearly the best of the next gen. Um, and he's won some tests. I still don't think he's a, uh, an amazing fly half at international level at the moment. But none of that's got to do with his size or weight. He doesn't. He's not playing well. Like he's not taking the ball to the line. He's not kicking his goals. So it makes no sense why you take two dinosaurs as your two five eights. I don't think. Um, and then I presume third third strings Reese Hodge, um, just in case. But, like, I'm not sure what the schedule is. If they've got any tour matches, they probably don't. But... Nah, it's Japan and then straight into yeah. Scotland and then England and then I can't remember the last couple of games, but they got a Barbas. England and Wales, maybe. Yeah, it's not quite a, it's not quite a full um, nah. Grand Slam tour, but it's a solid tour. It seems, it seems like it would be beneficial for a guy like him to go on that tour. He's, I agree. He, that... he won those French tests. So, like, fuck, like... As much as Quaid's still the uh, flavor of the month, he was very bad last test. Um, like, I hope he's good, but like, he's not going to be around next World Cup. I think, I, mean, be, I think he'll be a bag of bones by then. They left Harry Wilson at home too, which surprised. That, I, I'm starting to think he's done something bad. Um, he seems like a very knockabout character. Very good, like good at all sports from reports. Like he was a bit of an A.B. de Villiers character, good at cricket, good at this, good at that. I cannot understand why he's been left out of anything. He's he's not as flashy as Valentini and those guys, but he's big, he's tall, he's very hard, which is what makes a good international number eight. That's I, th- I think he'll be our next great number eight. I agree, but I, I don't know what he's then done to not get picked. So not, not once... In this series, was he picked? And then he, he's missed the he's missed the tour. Was so, he injured? I, uh, I don't that know. that could, that would be my only explanation. Or he's done he has done something that they've kept quiet. Like yeah, but he's, he's gone I don't out. think Dave that, Dave doesn't seem like the kind of guy to keep things quiet unless it's uh, it's true because he he blew up about the Marika and those boys going out. But yeah. like it, without throwing people in the dirt, like I don't understand how. Some of these guys have picked ahead of him. I just think he's he's probably the most important player at the Reds week in, week out, with the exception of O'Connor. So I don't know how he doesn't make that team. I'm going to call it now. I think we're going to go a clean sweep. I call that, and you said don't call that. <laughs> I think, look, I think we're a very good chance going clean sweep. Um, just because I'm sorry, I'm just scrolling through the guys. As, as you add those guys back in, Tolu Latu, big. Um, I didn't mention him yet. As you add those guys back in, you've got a very, very good team. And it, uh, I know I harp on about it, but it only takes one or two, three guys in the forwards, maybe one back to go from mediocrity to, hey, we're, we're pretty good here. Uh, and those European teams, not super positive footballing powerhouses. They're a little bit more like South Africa. They'll, they'll kick a lot. They'll scrum. They'll maul. You know, as long as we've got Taniela Tupo, to be honest, we'll be fine. Um, bring in Will Skeld and Rory Arnold, you're tall. Um, so I don't – I think it matches up quite well for us at the moment. I agree. I, I'm mad. I'm excited. I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, staying up all night, you know, coming home from the pub to watch the Wallabies play England. That I, We can lose every game on tour, but if we win that game, I'll be relatively pleased. Look, England. England have got a good team at the moment. I they they they're strong, but I just think I think oh, I think we'll do them. Like I just they've they've sort of managed to figure out that Nick White's a massive kicking nine, which you need. Um, they've got some centers who are genuine. Like Lenny Kitao goes on the cover, but he is a gangster from back. He's, he's been killing it lately. He, he but not yeah. Like not only in attack, he will he, if he if he gets a hold of you, you're you're going to be in a bit of pain. And I know you got you got Lavanini, which made me giggle. Um, but I suppose the, the only other guys um, who I haven't quite wrapped my head around yet is Pony Farm Silly's been in the squad for like two years. Never played him. 
he's what a are they doing? He's a freak. So the brief, my two week period down in Melbourne in 2018, as a you know a cover for their front row who were all sort of semi injured, who they didn't want to get really injured. Yeah, um, Pony was there. Pony was there, and uh, Laurie Weeks goes to me, "What's this guy?" And I watched him in a session, and he ran over like the most destructive, like like Taniella Tupo. He has that ability. Um, I think the set piece stuff is is his work on. He doesn't scrummage like Taniella Tupo. No, though. but yeah. around the field, he he was like Taniella Tupo. He's a freak. yeah. There's no doubting that. I just I just I'm just wondering what they're doing with him at this point. I was, like it, it would have been. He you would have like, thought that would have been a good opportunity. I would, I would have thought they capped him against Argentina. You know, to yeah. like Robbo's been there and done it. Um, I think you, I actually think he was injured. I actually think he was injured. Yeah. Otherwise, he might have. Um, the only other thing is, um, you know, Isaiah Parisi and Lalakai. They're the um, two who come into it. So Isaiah Parisi for me is a no-brainer. But agree, agree totally. Um, he's probably made, and I, you know, without knowing him, he made a very, very poor career decision to go to the rugby league. Um, when he left rugby league, and when he left for rugby league, I played him in that. And he would have been 17 or 18. And he was so, so, so fast, so hard to tackle. It can't be understated. And then, unfortunately, he went into a new sport and had to learn the new sport. So he was decent, but he was an out... I think he went on the spring tour. He was outstanding at 18 years old. He was he was Jordan Pattaya. He was fucking phenomenal. Um, so he's a no-brainer. And I think... I'm very happy for Lalakai. He's a very good guy. I just, I probably didn't see that one coming. Uh, I'd agree with you on Lalakai. Isaiah Parisi has what I call fuck you speed. Yeah. Um, he actually sidestepped me. So remember the Brisbane 10s when that was a thing? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> so someone said to me, why do they play the Auckland Nines in Auckland and the Brisbane 10s in, in Brisbane? Like, no wonder why neither of them are successful. Let's swap them. Brisbane's a rugby league town. Auckland's a rugby town. That sure. might make sense. Both are, uh, apparently they were owned by the same people. But any, anyway, so I, I, for whatever reason, I got picked for the Melbourne team. I think they didn't have enough numbers. And Tens is your game as well. Oh, it used to be. <laughs> it used to be. But I, I remember we're playing Queensland and Craig goes to me. I can't remember his last name, but good bloke. You'd know him. Craig, skills coach. He played for, he's coaching in Auckland at the moment. Yeah, he, but he played for Auckland. He's a halfback. Um, Craig, Craig, Craig. It's it's Craig McGrath. Craig McGrath. He's a fucking legend. Yes, great. Honestly, great, good, great bloke. He goes to me. <laughs> <laughs> great. <laughs> he goes to me. All right, Chubby, we're, we're going to... Yeah, mate, oh, I promise you, you'll get some game time this tour. Like, like for whatever reason he liked me I think he liked me anyway just not as a rugby player yeah. and puts me on against Queensland at Suncorp Stadium so that was pretty cool yeah. and um, packed in a scrum set a load of BPA who was very nice to me they didn't push uh, Taniela Tupo was playing and I'm defending underneath the goalposts and I, Isaiah Parisi gets the ball I'm like no this is like the busiest this place has been all day Kate's flown up to watch me play my dad's here he sidesteps me, scores under the post, and I get taken off immediately. <laughs> that's strong, bro. I, actually, you know what? That's um, that's fucking awesome. I mean, I remember you playing it, and I was very jealous. While we're telling stories about these players shitting on us, I, Felipe Dungunu, who's yeah. awesome. Yeah, uh, how's he not getting picked? I must show you how well Callaway's he's going. The, he's in the squad, at least. But, like, Callaway's going so well that he oh, is playing he, ahead of him. He's a freak, and we... Oh, we played him at TJ Milton one day. Uh, Taniella was playing as well. The, I could not imagine how little those guys wanted to be at TJ Milner um, on, a, on a Sunday <laughs> after their Super Rugby season. And we were having a competitive game. And I don't know, I must have ha I must have had one too many touches. I started getting very cocky, going down the blind side, throwing a big cutout. It's hit Filippo in the in the bread basket and he's run under the post <laughs> about 60 metres. He scored probably three tries that game. I think uh, Chris Sartia was playing and I got taken off immediately as well. So there you go. <laughs> oh, oh, mate, well, there's, some, there's some crazy good wingers. I remember, remember when Namani played for Randwick when he first came to... It's probably before your time. No, no, no. Ratu, Ratu, number seven, Agani. That's right. Bef yeah. the, the, the artist formerly known as Namani. 
Yeah, yeah. And I remember we're at Southern Districts. He's playing for Randwick. I'm in the defensive line, which I try and avoid doing it. I try and avoid doing that if at all possible. Demani Nadola gets the ball. He's always scored three tries. Everyone's gone, who the fuck is this guy? Because no one knew who he was. He's running directly at me. I've gone, holy shit. I'm going to have to like... <laughs> I, everyone's watching. I have to tackle him. And he gets you know, five minutes from me. Holy shit, holy shit, holy shit. Head down, terrible tackle technique. He chips the fucking ball. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I try and shoulder charge him on the way through just because I'm like, oh. Oh, thank God. And uh, he fucking knocks me straight over. <laughs> yeah, he, he was massive. I don't think, like, I know people know him as being a massive unit now, but when he's sort of a 22, 23-year-old, uh, he went via a different name and he was as massive, probably a little okay. bit faster, um, and a very scary dude. Very scary dude. He fulfilled his potential, uh, which he wouldn't have done here, in my opinion. No, he went to, uh, sort of ties into what we were saying last be- week, but he went overseas and he um, he did a bit of ITM and he did a bit of this and a bit of that and he played some international football. And, you know, now he's a really well-respected... I know he's, I've know i heard he's a fantastic guy as well, but he, he's a well-respected international player. So, I mean, that's that's a positive. Um, I suppose as well, Chubby, with that team, the Tars are somewhat sewn up their squad. Um, what are you laughing at? Nothing. You don't laugh. Yeah. This, is serious, this is a serious conversation. Sure is. So, uh, Gorn Talakai, um, he's having a great time in Beyond. Beyond. I, I know. I've enjoyed following him on Instagram. He looks like he's living it up. Hundred um, percent. Joe Cotton, your man. He's gone. Young fella. He might be back. Sam Wikes retired. Uh, from, what I, from what I heard, very very helpful. Um, in the squad while he was there in terms of just knowledge. He's just a good person too. Um, yeah, he's a really, really good guy, Sam Wikes. And I know an avid listener, so he hears this. Um, Jack Jack Maddox, born. Interesting. Where did he go? This says Pau, section Pau, Pau, blah, blah, blah. Where's Steve? Oh, good good Where's for him. Steve? He's a good guy too. I hope he's getting paid. Yeah, I agree. And then it has a guy, Aston Veit, Vaoutu. I'm not sure. I'm not sure who that is. No, no disrespect intended. Um, but new guys in. Uh, Holloway's back. Great, poor, great for the Tars. Poor player. Poor bloke. Terrible, terrible human. Bad name. Um, <laughs> nothing stacked up for Holloway at the moment. He certainly isn't living the dream with a American wife and a little gorgeous child and playing wherever he wants. So. In Florida. So fuck, fuck that guy. Um, yeah. <laughs> Oops, is back. Um, <laughs> It's probably going to be handy. Yeah, oh, you'd imagine so. Ned Haddingham's back. I reckon. I reckon that's going to be handy for him as well, mate. Where does is he a second row or a six? I reckon he's a six, and I reckon as much as Holloway hates to hear it, he's a second row. <laughs> well, <laughs> he doesn't listen. Um, oh, he does listen. He does listen. Yeah, actually, I know he's probably he's one of the few. So <laughs> I, you know what? I'm actually going to switch that. I disagree for the first time in podcast history. I don't. I play Ned in second row and play Holloway at six. Holloway's okay. lot, he's lightning fucking fast. As much as yes. I hate him, he's fucking, <laughs> he's one of the fastest men alive. So and he's getting he's as his hair's slowly thinning. He's I, I feel like he's probably getting a, a bit slower in his old age. Like you know he'd be pushing thirty now. He's 20, <laughs> 28. He's my age. Um, but yeah, look, I think they're both good to have back. I know Ned's got some concussion issues, or he had them, so hopefully he, he's through them. Um, Dylan Peach from Sevens. I don't know anything about him. So I Dylan, like I like Dylan, seeing the cultural stuff that they've done, and I understand he's incredibly fit and rapid. And I'm only just um, saying that because I know he plays seven, so you'd assume that he would be. Yeah, but that's all all I've seen of him. Well, he's he's a Kings boy. Um, my alma, alma mater, he, um, he was a number eight. So he's done the sort of, I suppose, the same thing as Lockie Anderson. Um, and he's done the, he's gone to sevens, become, I suppose, too, too quick, too fast. And now he's a winger. So okay. he's kind of signed him as a winger. I think that's a bit of an interesting one. Um, time will tell, I suppose. Um, but Tavita Funa is next from Seagulls. That's probably the biggest spanner I've had. Okay. What's your thoughts on that? Tavita Funa is young-ish. 
He's 23. He's played a little bit of league. Um, my experience with the league at any level, uh, whether it is shoot shield or professional, is hit and miss. Um, so the fact he's with the Tars indicates that perhaps either they were paying overs or he's, he wasn't as wanted as he maybe once was. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, as we spoke about, the top sort of contract is around that 250 mark. You know, he's probably coming from that, probably a little bit more, um, but hasn't played a lot of football just because Manly have been really, really good. Um, I don't see any harm in it, uh, but I don't have massive expectations. I, I don't know anything about him. Um, I, I think I agree with you on some leagueies are outstanding. Some leagueies are, have been very average. Uh, we don't need to name names, but I, I, I just feel like if, the, if they're, if they're serious about rebuilding from, how do I say this eloquently? I'm a little bit hungry. So my brain's all over the shop. Mm, mm. I feel like they should probably promote someone from within rugby. Well, uh, that, that would be my, my preference is there someone i don't know i you know there'd be smarter people than me that could make that call but i I feel like getting as many new south wales rugby guys back into the team is probably going to be helpful from a cultural point of view yeah i look i agree they've they've certainly like if if you've got the list they've got dylan peach davida funa and james turner's next from north so, okay, so it's pretty much a lot of New South Wales. They've really only they've really only thrown one guy sort of in there. That's um, a very very reasoned opinion from you. Well, it's, I, I bet <laughs> in look in my you know it's not like I was in an elite uh, player manager, but in my time there, um, they were always looking for a rugby league player. Okay, and they kept asking for one, and they kept asking for one. You know, if you're really good at rugby league, you they can't afford you. So. You know, Blake Ferg, they were looking for sort of a Blake Ferguson type. Um, what, would this, he get, what would he get in the league? 800? Fergo? Yeah. Um, give me a ballpark. <laughs> well, okay, so uh, over 600? Uh, I'd say in that arena. Okay, so pr- pretty pretty solid. Now, he's gone to NEC. Okay. So I think that's announced, but he's gone to NEC. Um and then Adrian Brown, young prof from Eastwood. So um, just on that whole thing, Tepo Amaroa, probably a great bloke, very, very poor rugby union player at this top point in his career, goes back to the Melbourne Storm, immediately becomes useful. Immediately. Uh, I, immediately. I, have a th- I have a theory on that. And the, this is probably another podcast, and I've talked about this on other podcasts, but the amount of people that you see leave a team with a bad system and go to a team with a good system and, uh, and start to kill it is so common that it's, um, you know, but, um, there's a, a number of guys in the Waratah squad, Namani Nadolo. Um, I think anyone that goes and plays for the Melbourne Storm is going to be a gr- good rugby league player. And, and the Tars were not good last year. So it's going to be very hard to look good in that team. Yeah, look, uh, they, they spent a lot of money on him. It wasn't, he wasn't a smart boy. He just changed as a player since he was a kid. He become a he become a rugby league prop. He wasn't a wasn't an inside center anymore. Um, and now he's sort of back where he belongs um, and doing what he does. Uh, all, the, all the guys seem to like him um, in terms yeah. of an investment from New South Wales rugby. Possibly not the smartest. Well, they, uh, they were spending about four hundred, so it's not it's not yeah. Anyway, that's that's all done now. So. Look, it, that's the squad somewhat sewn up. Um, so, look, it'll be interesting to see how they go. I do wish them the best. I think it's going to be a tough campaign. I agree. I think it'll be tougher than last year. I think it'll be tougher than last year as well. Um, my only my only other controversial... Uh, i got a controversial take of the week. And I know you already have uh, feuds with New Zealand players. New I mean, Zealand fans. Or, New Zealand not fans. Players, not players, with other players. Yes. I think the Minor 10 Cup is massively overrated for standard. What, what makes you say that? I, what, I watch a lot of it 
um, and the good teams like Tasman and, or historically in Canterbury and those guys who are feeding directly down um, are usually pretty good. Um, half of the comp and you really, you, you can't like, a lot of Mitre 10 footy gets lost in the, in the, the weights telecast is professional. The jerseys are professional. The commentary is professional. Everything's professional. If you break down and independently have a look at some of those guys, like for those, so some of those teams, they're not on another planet to club football here. Um, a lot of them play club football here. A lot of our got like play people from here, go play club football there. Um, I just think even as a player, I was always like, man, I'd love to play ITM. That'd be hectic. You know, it's awesome this, awesome that. I think there's the teams are sprinkled with a few absolutely outstanding players yeah. and then with some guys who aren't so great. I, I mean, agree with you. I feel like it's very inter- entertaining rugby to watch, but in terms of the quality of the rugby, you're probably right. I, I, I feel it's probably on par with Shoot Shield. Yeah, maybe a touch above it. Like the, sorry. That's an incredibly outrageous statement. I just yeah, said it's, it's the the high quality shoot shield at the end of the year when you've got a ton of Super Rugby players playing. You know there might be a smattering of Wallabies, like the the best that shoot shield gets. I think it, uh, a reasonable level game can compare. Yeah, Maybe. I mean, look, I've, I I almost went to Southland. Um, no disrespect, I'm probably glad I didn't. They were in a bit of a drought at that time and almost went to Northland. Um, but it's a, it really is a, it's a smattering of like legends, young kids who are young and then club players, particularly this time of the season where there's no All Blacks. So like, you know, I, I watch that and I know they're incomparable. I'll watch that and then I go watch Premiership and I'm like, these are, this is two ends of the world. So- I was just going to say, I have a, I have a, controversial statement as well i fucking love watching the english premiership oh yeah i love it it's great i reckon it's more entertaining than super rugby it's different i don't know whether people would agree with that well most people are stupid (laughs) (laughs) fuck you guys um no it's 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 different um but they're those guys are like from one to 23 they're professional footballers and you can tell a professional footballer the way when they walk in the room that, I suppose that's my point about Mitre 10 is, you know, uh, if I'm watching North Harbour play Manawa 2, there's, there's some genuine amateurs in that team. Yeah, There is. So the bottom end of the spectrum is not as, it's not as fancy as it's thought to be. That's all I'm saying. I still really like watching it, but I, I, I'm, I hesitate to go there to get rugby detail. I would go somewhere else. I think it's a lot more of a fun to watch. Um, okay, let's finish on this. I've been arguing with people online all week. I haven't got a lot of work on at the moment. Tight head prop is the hardest position in rugby. Changed my mind. I mean, it's going to be very hard for another prop. I'm, I was never a tight head prop for the record. Um, for anyone listening, and yes, there is a difference because um, I wasn't fucking, I wasn't strong enough, or I wasn't good enough. Um, okay. Sorry, keep going, keep going. <laughs> I'm going to push back. I'm going to push back on a couple of things, but keep going. I. It is the hardest position on the field, and I think hooker's second. But I, I, I think that you'll see, as we've spoken about on this podcast, Reese Hodges sliding at ten. Um, five guys get shot by a sniper in the crowd. Um, Tate McDermott will go to 10. He won't do a great job, but he'll do it. Um, you can't chuck Hooper in at tight end and you can't chuck Falau in at tight end either because there would ge- be a genuine health risk. They're, they're, there's a chance that they'll hurt themselves. So there's a reason that Taniela Tupo will be worth so much money when he goes to England. There's a reason poor Arlo Emil is getting paid a million pounds it's because you, you can't substitute them. You can't get away in a game without one. Um, if you don't have one, you're screwed. So okay, we, yeah. beautiful. You've said that incredibly <laughs> well. Okay. I've had all sorts of people push back on me. So, okay. So um, if I was big and – if Quade Cooper was as big and strong as Taniella Tupa, he'd be able to play tight head. With no experience? 
You tell me. No. I mean, of it, course it, he wouldn't. It we just, know we know class loose head props who are physical beasts who yeah. cannot play tight head prop. Correct. You look, it's it's you've got to have learnt it. It's it's stupid, and everyone's always like, oh, the dark arts this, the dark arts that. It's like riding a bike, but a really, really hard bike to fucking ride. And you do it from when you're a child. Um, the pressure and the strength is second to none. You then have to carry 125, 135 kilos around the field and be useful. Um, but put it this way, we if Quade's out, we're fine. If Tupo's out, we'll lose the test. Um, I would have Tupo as 5x more valuable than Quade to our Wallabies team. 5x. And that's probably on the light side. If we lost Quade, we would replace Quade with Noah, who would kick goals and pass the ball. If we lost Tupo, you're losing... At the moment, you go Alan Alatoa, then you'd go Pony Farm... No, then I reckon they would go James Slipper. Then I reckon they'd go Pony Farmer Silly. And look on the weekend, they had to get Greg Holmes. Lo- love him, but he's 38 years old. Um, you just can't... There, there are not enough good tight heads in this country or any country because it's fucking hard to do. But there's not... like. That you could get five guys in the 23 to play 10. That's right. They wouldn't do a great job. Maybe one of them would. Maybe Hodgie would be a, a decent 10. But you only have one other guy in the 23 who can play tight end. And there's a reason. It's literally in the rules is you can't have another guy go in there and do it because they'll break their fucking neck or they'll, they won't be able to do it. So uh, even coaches I know now who are backs, they know that like, when it comes to recruitment or when it comes to their roster, it's like, how is our tight head looking? And then we can go and look at 10. And they know that if there's three injuries at 10, we push the fullback up for a week, you know, we'll give him a rest and, you know, we'll bring the wing in a fullback and maybe we'll push a nine out to 10 for the last 20 minutes like Ian Pry used to do. But you can't do that with a tight head. You can't just build them. So if, they, if you, you can't push your hooker across. Why? Why? Tell, just tell me why. Sum it up for me. Because this, they, it's, a, it's skills that cannot be learned on the run. It's 5A, they are the best, the most skillful people in the team. They have all the skills, they have all the core skills. Uh, none of those core skills are transitionable to being a tight head. So if you don't have those tight head skills, you cannot just have them in your back pocket to use at a different time. You either have them or you fucking do not have them. Um, so it's an incom- it's completely incomparable. I, I don't think it's even much of an argument. I, I even think that like if you ask Quade Cooper, he would tell you that tight heads. So he's I, a sensible person who is logical and can. He's a sensei. He spent time in Japan and he's a sensei. But if you think the five eight is was it more difficult? The question? No, it's it's the hardest position. Hardest position. What is the hardest position? I think, I think number 10 is an incredibly difficult position to play, particularly at Test Rugby. You've got a serious amount of pressure coming at you. You've got the ball coming from there. You've got guys here who you have to control. There's game management. There's the defensive element. There's the attack element. There's, you're, you're running the team. There's no doubt it's a very hard job. And mm. not anyone can be a Test quality fly half mm. at, at a world-class level. I'm not saying that at all. But... If you swap Taniela Tupo with Quade Cooper, who have both played rugby their whole lives, mm-hmm. Taniela Tupo would probably not do a very good job as a game manager, would never kick the ball, but he's going to survive the game. Quade will not because it's fucking hard to play tight head prop. No, it's a specialist. It's like it's like having a normal soldier versus a sniper. Like you, It's just different. It's completely different. And, and even people with the physical ability... Still can't do it. Correct. Thank you. There's a list of 10 guys in the world who can do it, whereas I would say there's probably a list of 200 guys who are pretty good 10s. Um, I've, I've heard a lot, a lot of people say goal kicking is the hardest skill in rugby. Um, that was of, one of the arguments. A lot of people can goal kick. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's a hard skill like to be a 95% goal kicker, but fuck, I can goal kick. A lot of people can goal kick. Should we come, should we come down to stretch? But last five minutes of a game, if my tidy goes down, I can't chuck my second rower in there because, yeah. I'll one, I'll lose the penalty. Two, he'll probably lose his spine. So, like, it's literally in the rules that 
you can only have two in a team and you have to have two in a team and no one else can play there. Um, it's, I would have in order, I would have Whitehead, most important, Hooker second, because they got to do a lot. And then I would have 10 and nine next. Um, that's about it. I think if you've got a bad hooker, which we've seen, it fucks your game up. Yep. Um, you can't survive without a, without a tight head. So I'd have tight head, hooker, um, nine, 10, or 10, nine, and then loose head, and then locks. You're a sensible man. My computer is about to die, bro. Oh, I'm going to fucking clip that and share it. Thank you. Thank you for putting some sense into it because it was. I feel like people were arguing me just to infuriate me. I'm going... And someone would tell me, this is the way people think. They're, they're like, oh, no, no, hooker's harder than tight head. And I'm like, I played hooker. It's not harder. No. <laughs> oh, what do you know? <laughs> yeah, I look, fucking I, played all the positions in the front row. Like, tight think, head is the hardest. I think if you ask for Lau, I'd be like, mate, you can you can sort of go back five years and you change everything. You can be a tight head or you can stay a hooker. I think he'd, no probably, he'd probably pick hooker. I would have picked hooker over tight head. Yeah, it's, it's, it's tight head sucks. Sure does. And you got to be a really weird type of person to enjoy it. Um, yeah, mate. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for fi- Thank you for fucking finalizing that. And you know, the thing with this is people will still think that we're wrong. Oh, I'm happy to hear an argument for it, but like, but no one can give an argument because in their minds and yes, I'm talking to you back. So you know who I'm talking to. You've already made up your opinion in your mind and you're not going to listen to anyone else's opinion on it or any reason on it, give us, both of us are open to logical arguments. Give us one and we will change our minds. I'm happy to move my top five. I'm happy to shuffle them around if someone presents me with a cogent argument. Um, but being a, somewhat of a coach now um, and looking at my squad, um, I know that six guys can play 10 if we really needed it. And I know that two can play tight end. <laughs> That's it. Well, one really, one really, one, three, <laughs> three. Thanks for my team. All right, good to chat, buddy. I'm out of here. Good to Have talk. Go. Have a good one, mate. Pleasure as always. Bye, boy.